Let's see, let's get Mr. Smitherman back on the screen. See Mr. Heiser? I believe we've completed uh, what Mr. Smitherman wanted to say, at least at this point in time. And so I would turn him over to the other parties for their questions. Yes, thank you. Mr. Smitherman? He's back. All right, thank you very much. Um, let's see, I see Ms. Fox on the screen. go. Good evening, Mr. Smitherman. Good evening. Um, I just have um, a question and that is um, who and which company developed the data that you referred to in your presentation on the plant models the estimated emissions reductions and the estimated costs. Okay, there's a lot of information. Um, some of that was, all of it was done under my supervision and my uh, re request. Some of it was done by um, the Earth Science, Earth, Earth System Sciences. Some was done collaboratively with me and with some who? work with me, some was collaborative with me, and some of it I did myself. And uh, I'm not going to belabor this, but generally speaking, who generated the um, model plant information? That was uh, Mr. Reed Smith of Earth System Sciences, Earth Science Systems, I think. And uh, what about the estimated emissions reductions? We collaborated on those. Um, I'm sorry, I collaborated with Mr. Reed Smith on those. And anybody else? Not that I know of. And what about the estimated costs? Well, those came from the CTG, so in essence, it came right out of ERG's data. You didn't generate any of those uh, numbers for your estimated costs? Well, as I said, the estimated costs came from the CTG the information which ERG used. The tables that I showed uh, in my slides, I generated. I wanted to know. Thank you so much. That's all I have. Thank you, Ms. Fox. Is there another party who would like to ask questions of Mr. Smitherman? No? Don't see anyone else turning on their camera. Um, I'll turn now to the board for their questions. While I'm doing that, if you're on the platform as an attendee, and would have a question, please reach out in the chat. Uh, Madam Chair, do you have questions of Mr. Smitherman? Um, no, I don't. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Chair Trujillo Davis. Um, yes, I, I've got a couple of questions just to clarify and make sure I understood the data that you were presenting at the beginning of your testimony. Um, but first, can you uh, kind of explain or define for me a model plant? Excellent question. It took me a while to figure out um, what that was. It's an average facility. You've got a well site. And again, uh, here I'm using the well site just as we are defining that term in part 50. So it's well site would be all of the other equipment that would normally be associated with that separators, heater treaters, all those things. It's an average well site. In essence, you take all of the different well sites that are out there, 
how many separators are on a typical site. Take the total number, divide by the sites, and you've got maybe 3.2 separators. You've got maybe 0.5 compressors. That's what you end up with is a average number of compound of equipment types per site. Same thing for the gathering and boosting stations. You create an average gathering and boosting station. Okay, that is super helpful. Um, and then that model plant is what was, is the basis for section 116, is that correct? Which you do use the model plant for, is you take that model plant, which in, in essence, you end up with the total number of components that could leak at the average site. You multiply that times the leak rate for each one of those component types and you add all that up and you get the average leak rate of gas out of the average site. And then of course you convert that to VOCs because all gas is not VOC. And that ends up with the average emissions of VOC for the average site. Okay, <clears throat> so your contention was that NMED used data from 1996 and uh, Namoga was using data from 2019. That's correct. And specific data from 2019, specific to San Juan Basin and specific to the Permian Basin. And not only was the data that, he, uh, that the department used was 1996 based survey, it was not necessarily New Mexico based survey. And think about this too, you know, times have changed. We recognize that these components can leak. So wouldn't you think that engineers would start trying to reduce the number of components that could leak in their facility designs? And that's why when you look at recent data, you see that those component counts are down and therefore their leak potential is down. Just makes sense. Um, well, yes, actually, that's what struck me about your testimony. Um, the, the just the difference in facilities that were built in 1996 versus a facility even built in 2015 is drastically different. Um, the I, I remember back in 2012 when we were going through the initial stages of the greenhouse gas reporting and there was a lot of work being done on valves and I actually made the joke at the time that I should invest in valves and I really should have. <laughs> but um, I'm curious if, if any of that, um, if, if the 2019 data uh, was any of that was based on those greenhouse gas reports that I, I know are due annually and each company makes that report to the EPA. Our model plant was specifically based on greenhouse gas reporting data. So we use data for, for, for specifically for the San Juan Basin greenhouse gas report and the specifically for the Permian Basin uh, uh, greenhouse gas report. So we used actual data from those basins and assumed, I got to admit, we assumed that the data, the average uh, across the entire San Juan would not be any different than Colorado versus New Mexico. So we basically use San Juan as a representative of the gas wells in Northwest New Mexico. And we use the data in the Permian Basin, Texas and New Mexico as a representative of the oil wells in New Mexico. Okay. Um, and I, I think my last question kind of just uh, continues to kind of speak to that, but um, you know, the oil fields are are very different. Um, the San Juan versus the the Permian, and I'm one, and they go up and down too. They they have sunny days and um, and <laughs> cloudier times. So I'm wondering, in 1996 or the mid 90s, did you, was the state seeing that level of activity? that um, we are seeing today. And, and again, I realize that those two basins are probably experiencing different things. So I'm just kind of wondering 
um, as far as activity level, uh, you know, are we comparing apples to apples in this situation? An excellent question. I, I really can't necessarily give you personal experience in the Northwest, but I can give you very good personal experience in the Southeast part of the state. Uh, in the 90s, started seeing quite a bit of activity in more conventional drilling. It was just the time that we started putting our toe in the water for horizontal drilling in, in the Permian Basin. So actually, uh, activity was moderate in the 90s, um, not nearly what it is today. And the character has changed dramatically between 1996 and 2019. And so in the in the 90s, did uh, the industry and I, I don't know the 90s, I had to say too. Well. <laughs> um, but so I'm curious in the 90s were were most of those wells that were being drilled um, single well facilities where there's one facility or one well per facility. I, the, the, ER, the, the, the data indicates and there's a there's quite a long bit of discussion uh, with uh, associated with the EPA on putting these model plants together and figuring out how many wells per site that they're going to assume. You not, might have noticed that in our work and ERG's work, we use two wells per site. That's probably not far off back in in the early uh, in the early or mid nineties. I know that, that our company tended to have more than two per site, some places a little less than that, but it was a time when that was not terribly unusual to have a small number of wells per battery. That is changing. And I think as we watch over time, we're gonna see the number of wells per site go up. And that is a very good thing. It's a good thing for a lot of reasons. And one of the reasons is it's gonna, you're gonna see a drop in the number of components per well, because as you put more wells on a site, they're more efficient and therefore they have fewer components per well that they're serving. So that's a good thing. They're also smaller in footprint. Each individual site may be bigger, but you're, you're using one site where you might have used multiple sites in the past. That's good for the, for the surface of the earth also. Um, okay, thank you. You answered my follow-up question um, with that. So uh, thank you and I appreciate uh, your time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Member Bitzer. Yeah, um, real quick. One of the slides was talking about uh, early on was done about the things that uh, we're not regulating uh, the non hydrocarbon. Uh, one of the non hydrocarbons that was was listed was H2S and I'm assuming that's hydrogen sulfide. Is that correct? That's correct. I, I know it stinks. Isn't it also toxic? Uh, it is toxic. And when I say not regulated, I don't mean not regulated. I mean, it's not a part of this particular rule because it's not an ozone precursor. Right. It's highly okay. regulated. Yeah. Because it's, it's uh, very toxic. toxic. Exactly. Thing. Okay. And, uh, and then you finally, yeah, I was going to ask about the many wells. You, you, um, you talk about many wells on the same, essentially the same pad. I thought the directional drilling or the, or the, what did you call it? Uh, horizontal drilling was all the same hole, basically. And then you just turn directions once you went, once you went down, you're, you're drilling multiple holes in the same, uh, off the same pad. Is that what you're telling me? We, we are. There, there, there are technologies where you could drill multiple laterals from the same, same well bore. Not many operators have adopted that yet. So most of the time you'll see an individual well bore for an individual horizontal lateral. But these wells are close together. They, they literally can be 10 or 15 feet apart from each other. <clears throat> so you can put a lot of wells on a pad. <clears throat> Fair enough. That's all I had, uh, Madam Hearing Officer. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Member Garcia. 
Uh, yes, I just had a clarifying question, please. Um, you said that the the gains uh, between going uh, inspecting quarterly versus monthly were diminishing returns. And I think I understand intuitively what you're meaning by that, but I'm also looking at it in terms of over time. Wouldn't you have older equipment and uh, uh, still be able to catch more uh, leaks and problems in the equipment? Now, I understand your point that yes, you catch more, but it becomes so much more expensive uh, for the tons of uh, um, emissions reduced that it's not worth it. Uh, but there still is an opportunity to, to catch more leaks um, if you increase the frequency, right? And then some of the leaks, um, if you have older equipment, uh, they could they could be larger or smaller depending on the year or the time that you do it. Uh, it's it, you can't predict that, correct? Uh, you, you cannot predict it. The data seems to indicate, in fact, the data has consistently indicated that under any LDAR frequency, once you put the LDAR program in place, the number of leaks found in each successive survey goes down. In essence, what you're doing is you're finding those weak points <clears throat> in the system that are about to break and or that have broken and you repair them and replace them. And in essence, you're, you're, you're taking the weak links out and you couple that with two other things. You couple that with now weekly AVOs, which the OCD is requiring documented AVOs. Now we've heard testimony that AVOs are not as effective as Eldar and I'll agree with that, but it's not nothing. In fact, I was on a site about two months ago and even these 63 year old ears could hear a malfunctioning controller. So you can find substantial numbers of leaks through audio, visual and olfactory um, uh, surveys. So that's the second kind of component of the three legged stool. And, and, and the other is maintenance and making sure that we're operating and maintaining our equipment and documenting that as we're going to be required to do so is the third leg. And all of those together are going to drive down uh, leaks and drive down emissions. Quite frankly, it drives up the cost per ton of Eldo because you've been successful. In fact, that's why many operators are asking for an alternative uh, plan because they're going to eventually find ways to use new technologies to screen and find places that they need to do Eldar and be able to optimize those costs and reduce emissions further at a lower cost. Very much, I appreciate that. That's all. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Member Honker. Uh, yeah, just a couple of questions, Mr. Smitherman. Um, I was looking through your presentation and I, I see a lot of, you know, cost per ton of reduction, but I didn't see the absolute costs for your model plant of, uh, you know, annual cap costs of, of doing LDAR uh, annually, semi-annually, quarterly. Are those in there somewhere? Not in my slides. Um, I can tell you what we used. It was the same thing that uh, from the CTG, we used $1,370 per site for annual Eldar, and that is corrected to $2,019. We used $2,375 <clears throat> for semi-annual on well sites, and we used $4,385 for quarterly, again, for well sites. I, I didn't write down my gathering and boosting cost. Uh, I, I do have the annual number, which was 8,082, but I, I, I got distracted and didn't finish my table. Okay. Um, so, so the, some of these costs per ton are, are 
are really over multiple periods of doing Eldar, are they not? Or, or multiple years in some cases, you know, to actually it's all. Oh, sorry, go ahead to get to the numbers like, like in your slide 50. Um, you must be adding costs through several years, maybe, maybe under your calculations, that's what it takes to get a, a ton of pollutant reduction. Each of my numbers is on an annual basis. So it's the okay. annual cost for Eldar. If you did Eldar quarterly, it's all four of those Eldar survey costs combined for the year. And it's the tons of remissions for just that year. Okay, all but, on an annual basis. But uh, I guess picking up on what member Garcia was asking about, wouldn't most of your reductions come during the few, first few cycles of, of doing Eldar? They do. We do see a diminishing return on repeated Eldar surveys. Um, the The emission factor, emission reduction factors from uh, the EPA are the emission factors that everyone in this uh, uh, hear, hearing have used, and they're static. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. That's that's all I have. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr. Heiser. Does any of that uh, prompt redirect? Um. I do have a question for Mr. Smitherman, which is not completely redirect, but I think if Madam Hearing Officer will indulge me, she'll understand why I want to ask that question. <laughs> so, Mr. Smitherman, you've heard a number of pieces of testimony throughout this hearing about concerns of fence line communities. Did you know the gas industry have you not? OGA have anything it wants to say about what it would like to do to address some of those concerns? Certainly. Um, and really, from a personal standpoint, I understand uh, that. Um, I actually, my, my own home is within just a little over a half a mile from 21 gas wells and two gas compressors. And within a mile, I actually have 26 wells and three compressors. So it, it does hit a little closer to home. And we, recognize and, and, and sympathize with the uh, concerns that um, others have expressed about this. And we, we would like to offer a um, possible solution. What we'd like to offer is um, right now, some of these wells that could be near occupied areas uh, are not required to have uh, weekly LDAR under OCD's rules or under these rules. You mean weekly AVO? Excuse me. Thank you very much for that. That would be really expensive. Uh, weekly AVOs. And we would suggest that all of these sites that are occupied within whatever footage that the enemy defines as appropriate have weekly, a uh, weekly AVOs. And that LDAR for those sites be quarterly. That seems to strike a balance between the really, really, as I've, as I've discussed, really high cost to do LDAR on a monthly basis. And, and it, but it also makes sure that we have documented a, uh, ABOs on a weekly basis on those sites. Thank you, Mr. Smitherman. And so, Madam Hearing Officer, I thought that sort of a re recent development would be of interest to the board members. And of course, if there are questions from the parties, we're happy to have that happen as well. All right, let me check. Um, would any party like to turn on their camera? I have a question about Mr. Smitherman's last statement there. Not seeing anyone, Mr. Heiser. Uh, would any board member have a question of Mr. Smitherman's last statement? Just wave your hand. Oh, member Garcia. Uh, yes, just to understand, uh, would you be proposing language uh, and in a particular? I know this is we're talking about 116, but would you be proposing language 
uh, to fine tune exactly what you're saying? We'd be happy to do so. Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for that follow up um, question, Member Garcia. And just to follow up on that, and just in terms of process, I was just wondering um, how uh, not to open up another can of worms, but just so I can get my head around this. Maybe this is a question for a hearing officer. Would we be able to have Mr. Smitherman back at some point after some of the other testimony that we hear on this particular item on 116? Uh, and in particular, related to his testimony and some of the prof proffers. So um, I was about to state, actually, we still have several witnesses to go on 116. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the board can certainly request that Mr. Smitherman make another appearance. It will depend on his availability. I understand he's not available tomorrow. Uh, but let me ask about future availability. Uh, Madam, available. Mr. Smitherman is available on Friday. Um, that's probably our most immediate need would be that Friday. Uh, he's got some availability sporadically thereafter, which and we would work to make him available at anybody's convenience. But hopefully we can wrap this up on Friday. I think that's still everybody's goal. Yes, yes, firm, firm goal. Um, all right, so um, Madam Chair, does that answer your question? Um, it does in terms of his availability, and I was just wondering if there would be language in the meantime um, proposed so that um, we could follow up with with that to, um, to add on to Member Garcia's uh, question and comments. Let me ask Mr. Heiser. Madam Hearing Officer, yeah, sorry, I'm having video problems. Uh, yes, uh, we will propose uh, language uh, along the lines that you just heard from uh, Mr. Smitherman on this issue, and we'll try to get that to the board uh, perhaps tomorrow morning. Uh, and I'm sure that we maybe have other discussions as well, but we will be getting language in. Thank you. Thank you. And then, Madam Hearing Officer, I wonder if the only other thing would be Mr. Smitherman's testified to the obviously the non proffered stuff. I think the tables are going to be easier for everybody to follow than trying to read it in the transcript. I'm wondering if it would be appropriate to go ahead and mark this as an ex Demoga Exhibit 58 without the proffered materials, and then to have those materials 58, uh, our 59, 60, and 61. Uh, any objections uh, from any other party? I'm, I'm going to mute you, Madam Chair. Um, any objections from any other party uh, uh, to that uh, proposal? I think it might be easier to follow the transcript. Okay, uh, we'll do that, uh, Mr. Heiser. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Hearing Officer. And I see uh, Mr. Rose on the screen. Uh, yes, Madam Hearing Officer. Before, um, don't want to throw rain on this parade, but. Um, as to Mr. Smitherman's last proposal, I just wanted to note that that there there may be folks who would want to opine on that proposal who may not be here because, um, it, at least in my estimation, it's beyond the scope of the notice that you gave. And so, both pro and con as to the proposal. And so, I think entertaining a regulatory proposal at this late date. Um, may may prejudice some folks who aren't going to be who aren't here or aren't available to testify on that. So, just wanted to alert the board that there may be an issue with respect to taking that up in the context of of this particular hearing. It may be the fodder for a future hearing, but from my perspective, I think you're going to have notice issues with respect to this hearing. Thank you for that, Mr. Rose. Um, I would certainly uh, want to keep notice issues in mind. I'm sure that Ms. Solaria would also uh, have um, uh, be keeping that in mind, but thank you for that. Uh, any other questions from the board? No? All right, uh, then thank you, Mr. Smitherman and uh, Mr. Heiser. Uh, it is 6.40. Uh, I'm not sure what else we can do that would um, fit in the next 20 minutes. Um, 
Ms. Katz? Oh, I'm sorry. I see Member Garcia waving. Just a quick question about the status of where we are. Are we are we uh, looking like we're going to finish by Friday? Are we doing okay? <laughs> we have a lot of topics, and I did want to mention that. Um, this was the paper I was looking for just now. Um, we need to hear from Mr. Alexander before we can tie up uh, topic 117. We need to hear from Mr. Alexander before we can tie up um, topic 122. We still have uh, several witnesses on this topic, uh, Eldar. And then, of course, we also have um, topics, uh, I believe, 123 and, I'm sorry, yeah, sections 123 and 124. Um, right, Ms. Katz? Yes, and we there's also another topic, um, for the topic um, that's numbered 37, which is uh, the proposed proposal for reduced submission completions uh, from EDF, CAA, CPP, and NAVA. All right. Um, so I, um, I would ask uh, my my ask would be that we try to push through and get finished with Eldar this evening um i that would be the only chance that we i think we would have to potentially wrap things up um friday by the end of friday um so that would be what i would ask <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure there's going to be that. opinions on that Okay. Moga is supporting that as well, Madam Hearing Officer. I'm sorry, repeat yourself, Mr. Heiser. I said Namoga is supportive of trying to push through to the end of Eldar today if we can. All right, uh, Mr. Boutsier. GCA also supports that proposal. I think we should absolutely do everything we can to finish Friday. Uh, Ms. Fox. Thank you, Madam Hearing Officer. Uh, we can uh, support staying later. That's not a problem, but our one Eldar witness, uh, Miss Leanne Hill, the only conflict she's had in the whole two weeks is tonight, right now. And so she is not available right now, but she is available all day tomorrow. So we could put her, if we get through everybody but Miss Hill, we could put her on first thing tomorrow morning. All right, Ms. Peranos, um, we would go back to Tammy Thompson at this point. Correct. I am definitely supportive of continuing and getting through Eldar this evening. I do need to see if she is available because I had indicated to her that we usually wrapped up with witness testimony by 6 p.m. So let me try I to get her, her now. Form. There she is. Oh, perfect. That's amazing. All right. Uh, let's go then to uh, Dr. Thompson and see if we can get just a little bit further this evening. Um, Cheryl, are you doing okay? If you can give me just a second to turn a light on. Thank it's getting you. dark in here. Go ahead. All right, thank you. Uh, go ahead, Ms. Pranius. Terrific. Um, and um, I believe that last time, well, perhaps not, well, I'll just, so, Dr. Thompson's exhibits are um, EDF Exhibit A, which are our proposed red line, um, GG, HH, II, JJ, TT, uh, and that is her direct testimony exhibit TT. Um, Dr. Thompson, uh, do you have any revisions to your uh, direct testimony that you filed with respect to section 116? I do not. Um, and please let me know if if you all can hear me well enough. I know I've had some audio issues in my office before, so. We can hear you fine right now. At least I can. Um, could you could you please summarize for the board? Uh, the opinions in your uh, testimony regarding EDF's alternative proximity proposal. Sure. I support EDF's proximity proposal 
based on, um, or the, I'm sorry, the proposed proximity based LDAR requirement that will reduce volatile organic compounds that contribute to ground level ozone and reduce exposure to harmful pollutants for persons residing, working, or playing within a thousand feet of oil and gas facilities. In addition, Increasing the frequency of well site inspections and quickly repairing any malfunctioning or leaking equipment, as proposed by EDF, will reduce the emissions of all VOCs from oil and gas operations in New Mexico. This, redu this resulting reduction in VOCs will help New Mexico reduce local formation of ozone and thus help New Mexico stay in attainment of the National Ambient Air Quality Standards for ozone. Ozone, as we know, is a criteria pollutant that EPA recognizes as dangerous to humans. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Um, and if you could please just elaborate a bit on the ozone benefits of EDF's proximity-based LDAR proposal. Right. Um, so again, one of the clear benefits of EDF's proposal is that it will lead to these additional VOC reductions. And as we've talked about before, VOCs are a key component to ground level ozone. So by reducing VOCs, you will help reduce the local formation of ozone and help the state remain in compliance of the ozone max. So as um, my colleagues have stated earlier today, EDF estimates that requiring quarterly rather than annual or semi-annual inspections at well sites with site-wide VOC, VOC emissions less than five tons per year will result in an additional 2,080 tons of VOC reductions annually. And if you bump up the inspection frequency to monthly for all the well sites located within a thousand feet of occupied areas that emit greater than five tons per year of VOCs, we will re remove an additional 3,600 tons of VOCs from the atmosphere. So again, VOCs, as, as I spoke about in my last testimony, are a key component to the formation of ground level ozone. We know that ground level ozone, as, as one of the public um, testimonies stated earlier, is a dangerous air pollutant. It's like a sunburn to your lungs. I liked that, um, but it is a very reactive um, species that um, reacts with your lung tissue and damages it. Exposure to elevated concentrations of ozone lead to serious adverse health effects, including asthma, increased emergency room visits, and premature death. Impacts, these impacts are particularly severe in sensitive populations like children and the elderly. And we know that ozone also causes direct harm to the environment. Um, it impedes plant growth and vitality, and we know it decreases crop yield. As we've heard and discussed, air quality in seven counties in New Mexico is dangerously close to being out of compliance with the federal health-based standards for ozone. Much more must be done to protect healthy air and to protect against air quality degradation in New Mexico. These additional inspections at well sites, especially near occupied areas, can help the department protect air quality. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. And um, if, could you explain to the board what benzene is? Benzene is a well-established cause of cancer in humans. It is recognized as an air toxic by the US EPA and um, air toxics, these, they're these compounds that are listed as air toxics are also referred to as hazardous air pollution, air pollutants or HAPs. So those terms can be used often interchangeably and I just wanted to clarify that. So air toxics and hazardous air pollutants recognized by the US EPA and benzene is one of them. And again, it has been um, solidly linked to cancer in humans. Thank you. And do oil and gas sources emit benzene? Yes, um, benzene is one of the VOCs that is emitted from oil and gas production. Um, benzene, along with as other hazardous air pollutants, again, HAPS. Um, and we have heard from our colleague that the measurement 
um, campaign done by the University of Wyoming and New Mexico found high levels of benzene in the emit, emit, emissions from New Mexico wells. Thank you. And is there any safe level of exposure to benzene? No. No, the US EPA and the World Health Organization have made that declaration. Um, and WHO, World Health Organization, states that there is no safe level of exposure to these toxic compounds. Um, to go into a little bit more detail, we, um, <laughs> given up, I put my notes away. Um, so the relationship between, so what's called the dose response curve, the relationship between human health response and the dosage, what you're breathing in. So that is um, assumed to be linear and it crosses the X axis at zero, meaning the only way to reduce your risk of health, of a negative health response to these components is to have zero um, exposure to them. So there's no, there's no, there's no level where we can say nothing is going to happen. Great. And uh, Dr. Thompson, could you describe some of the studies um, that have examined health impacts to people that live, work, or play near oil and gas facilities? Sure. I will talk about a very comprehensive study that was done by the Colorado Dep Department of Public Health and the Environment, also, uh, CDPHE. And so this study links air pollution emissions from oil and gas production operations to potential serious human health impacts in populations living at specific locations near or specific vicinity to um, well sites. And so this is a modeling study that used emissions um, that were measured from specific um, they were measured from specific processes. So um, a team went out and measured basically plumes from four types of processes on well sites. So they have emissions associated with drilling, fracking, flowback, and production. So we take these emissions estimates and we use a model um, this one is called AIRMOD. It's recognized by the US EPA. It's a dispersion model. And we represent various, um, well, uh, actually many years of meteorological data um, that can, that represent a lot of variability in wind speed and wind direction. And they used what's called a Monte Carlo approach where they measured the plumes from um, Emission, emissions plumes representing a number, representing tens of thousands of different wind speeds, wind direction, emissions rates. Um, so to take a step back, um, the purpose of this whole study was to understand the range of potential concentrations that people living and breathing near well sites might be exposed to for a short time, an hour, like a, an acute hourly um, exposure to a longer time, an annual to lifetime exposure. And they take into account um, different activity patterns, how much time you might spend outdoors, how much time you might spend actually in the vicinity. And they looked at, um, discrete, well, they, they actually looked at a continuous range of points between like right at the well site to 2,000 feet. And this, again, the study used years, used years worth of data, wind speed and wind direction. One of the, um, one of the challenges, and this came up earlier, you know, how representative um, the meteorology, meteorology and the understanding of how wind, wind, um, can impact what's downwind. So first off, <laughs> there's 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 always going to be shifts in wind that will move pollutants around. So there's no there's no place that's going to be upwind and safe all the time, right? Um, and then there's low wind speeds where pollutants can kind of just sort of slowly disperse and settle, and then it does create more of like a circle around the um, the 
site or the, the source. So, so they took into that account, they took that into account and they actually mapped out, um, you know, by wind speed and wind direction, all of the, the data that they use. And it was fairly representative. So you got the full, the full circle of direction and you got um, a wide range of wind speeds to, to, to show what these, um, what, what the range of impacts would be. Right, and so from that, from that, they looked at the minimum and the maximum. They looked at the average, so what you could expect, um, and they compared that to again our best understanding of human health response. And again, we talked about how there's no safe level of exposure. So how they do it is they use our they use animal models and our understanding of health response to estimate a one in a million chance of getting cancer, an additional chance of getting cancer associated with a certain type of, with a certain level of exposure. And that's the limit that they set. Anything above that, they, um, there, there's a red flag. And so that's how, that's what this study was looking at. Any increase over that one in a million chance of, um, of, of get, getting cancer from this exposure. Um, and so what they found, uh, so this, again, this study of Monte Carlo, tens of thousands of runs, they created these, these surface maps of, of concentrations around well sites. And they used three different types, they used three different sizes of well sites um, where they increased the emissions representing um, three to 18 particular well drilling sites on a well pad and they instead of instead of representing the well sites as point sources they smeared it across the um like the one acre plot with three well sites instead of three point sources it was an area source which has the effect of underestimating what the max um concentration could be you can imagine a plume from a specific source um transporting out versus which is how it is in real life versus that same emission smeared across a one acre well, well plot where it's artificially diluted uh, ahead of time. And so that, that had the, the effect of actually um, underestimating what the potential concentration could be probably by a little bit. But I saw um, there was testimony saying that that was um, overestimating, but it wasn't, it was underestimating. So um, here are some of the things that they found with respect to benzene and other um, hazardous air pollutants. So benzene exposure from both production emissions alone, but then also from all activities combined. So that's the drilling, fracking, flowback, and production. We're associated with an increased lifetime risk. So again, above one in a million of leukemia for just an average individual at 500 feet. So again, they looked at like minimum, like um, someone who wasn't exposed to the maximum concentrations and maybe spent less time in that vicinity versus the maximum. And so they looked at just, an, and then an average individual, so like the median. And that person had an increased risk of leukemia at 500 feet. They also looked um, and they found risks in population exposed to the highest concentrations. So again, you know, using the modeling, finding that location of the highest benzene concentration, only dropped to below the one in a million risk threshold after a distance of 2,000 feet. So that was important, right? So you had to get 2,000 feet away from the well to, to drop your the, the maximum risk of increased um, leukemia to below that one in a million risk threshold. So in addition to the cancer risks, there are also risks associated with blood disorders and immune disorders. So this, this question also came up earlier, right? Um, and what they found for non-cancer health risks. So, I mean, this is similar to the headache, like that acute, like, oh, I, I, I don't feel good, right? This is, this is, a, this is associated, this can be associated with that. So benzene and two ethyl toluene emissions were found to be higher than what is considered acceptable risk for most of the simulated populations at 500 feet away after. So this is a one hour acute exposure. And then 
um, exposures of benzene were more than 10 times higher than the acceptable risk for that one hour maximum exposure. And therefore, it's a, it's a risk for blood disorders. And again, blood disorders can result in anemia, disturbances in clotting, or the ability to invite infections um, could manifest as fatigue, nosebleeds, or infections. And then the study also found the potential for neurotoxic effects, such as headaches, blurred vision, dizziness, from um, the combined acute exposure of benzene and 2-ethyl toluene. And so these risks were seen with acute exposure in every age group. And these exposures and risks um, were highest during the flowback stage. They were higher than those from other drilling and fracking activities. Thank you so, so much. Yep, go ahead. Thank you. That was a super helpful summary. Um, could you describe, uh, in your opinion, what the policy implications are uh, that flow from the CDPHE study? Yeah, I mean, it it shows it shows a, a a need for more stringent controls of oil and gas emissions at well sites, especially located near to where people play, work, or recreate. People living near oil and gas sites will breathe in more of these harmful species. And as we've, as, as the CDPH, CDPHE study has shown that if you're living within 2000 feet of an oil and gas site, they have evidence to suggest that there is the potential that humans could inhale enough to statistically increase their likelihood that they will develop cancer or other negative health effects. Thank you so much, Dr. Thompson. Those are all of my questions. Um, and, and there is no sir rebuttal from Dr. Thompson. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Peranios and Dr. Thompson. Uh, I see Mr. Rose uh, and then Mr. DeSalen. Um, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Madam Hearing Officer. I just wanted to remind the board that that this testimony was subject to the objection that I raised earlier concerning the relevance in this hearing. Um, Dr. Thompson, it looks like basically you took your uh, rebuttal testimony, which is EDF Exhibit TT, and sort of expanded on what you had said in your rebuttal testimony. Is that correct? Or explained what you said in your rebuttal? That's right. I tried to make it in, in just more understandable language. Um, is the Colorado study in the record of this proceeding? Did you offer that as an exhibit to your testimony? If I didn't, that was an oversight. Um, and, and Madam Hearing Officer, without the study, obviously, it's difficult to evaluate and question the witness as to the um, propriety of her statement. So, and I think we talked about that earlier in terms of proper uh, rebuttal testimony or sur rebuttal. So just wanted to note that for the record. Um, in terms of your discussion of health impacts, I know you talked about benzene and, and potentially um, other pollutants that are comprised or maybe emitted from well sites. Um, is, is your concern impacts of those contaminants, the components of emissions from, from well sites as opposed to uh, concerns about exceeding the ozone nax? Um, I'm, it, it, it's not either or, right? It would be both, both are harmful to humans. Well, I guess what I'm getting at is when in your discussion about impacts of of emissions on facilities or residences or or uh, people that occupied structures that are close to oil and gas wells, I was wondering whether your testimony about impacts was because the the ozone NACs were being exceeded at those locations, or because um, you believe that there are other impacts from those emissions uh, that may not be directly related to ozone concentrations. I, I believe it's I believe it's both. Um... Let me let me put it more directly. Do you have any evidence that the ozone NACs are being exceeded at these locations? Um, I 
believe we were talking about preventing the exceedance in the future, but also there's no safe level of ozone. So it's not necessarily, I mean, if I'm talking about human health, there is no safe, safe level of ozone. So there's no level of ozone that people can breathe where they're not going to have a negative or they're not, it's going to be good for them, right? It's going to be bad for them at any level. So yeah, I would be concerned about that as well. I take it you disagree with with the federal ozone NACs that we're talking about here? I is it your opinion? And I mean, <laughs> scientists have been trying to make it lower for a very long time. Health scientists have said it needs to be lower for a very long time, and that could be in the future, and that's something to, to be prepared for, right? Um, and I guess the follow-up question is, did, did easy EDF propose that New Mexico adopt, adopt a lower ozone uh, primary, primary ambient air quality standard from the federal standard? Is that part of your proposal today or has no. EDF proposed that the state adopt a more stringent standard? No, that is not part of the proposal. At, no, it is not. Okay, and, and with respect to your testimony about, about non-health related impacts, I take it the federal secondary standard is designed to address those impacts. Um, what's the federal secondary standard for ozone? Do you know offhand or is there one? Yeah, so it's it's related to, oh my goodness, it's a, it's a complicated, um, it's a complicated measure that looks at the average daylight ozone over the course of, it's, it's more complicated than the eight hour, but yes, there is a secondary standard that looks at basically like daytime exposure of plants over the course of a longer period of time. And, and are you, do you know whether New Mexico's adopted either a, a primary or secondary ozone standard that's more stringent than the national standards? No, I'm sure. I, I, so, but I objection I this really goes way beyond the scope of Dr. Ten Thompson's testimony. I think, I think it doesn't, Madam Hearing Officer. I think the notice of this hearing said we're to talk of the hearings to consider um, measures to assure that one implementing the state statute, but to assure that uh, the national ambient air quality standard for ozone is met, and that we're regulating ozone precursors to it to assume that. And I think uh, Dr. Thompson's testimony goes well beyond implementing the ozone NACs. It goes to other health effects, which, which are not the subject of this hearing based on the notice of this hearing. Uh, that, that's the basis of my objection to the admission of, of this testimony and to the extent it's being considered, it seems to me, I have the right to explore exactly what she's asking this board to consider and whether it's appropriate to consider it. Um, Ms. Paranios, I, I tend to agree with Mr. Rose that uh, um, he can explore uh, all of her testimony. I would just note that Dr. Thompson is not a lawyer, and so her knowledge of what the state of New Mexico has or has not adopted with respect to its own ambient air quality standard is well beyond the scope of her expertise. All right, that's right. Um, so hold on, uh, Mr. Rose. Uh, Dr. Thompson, uh, please, uh, if there's a question that goes uh, beyond the scope of your expertise, um, you can certainly uh, note that. Mr. Rose. And, and that's all I was asking for. I don't think you have to be a lawyer to be able to read the, the, the board's regulations and determine what they say. And in fact, she's testifying on the national standards. So I think she certainly can, just can testify if she knows whether there's a, an equivalent state standard on those topics. Um, with respect to cancer risks, Dr. Thompson, do you know if there's um, any New Mexico or this board has adopted um, any criteria for acceptable cancer risks? Not to my knowledge. And are you familiar with the uh, toxic air pollutant program um, that's part of the, the board's um, NSR permit rules? I am not um, detailed. I, am, I do not, have, <laughs> I'm not very familiar with that. And, and I was curious as to whether 
I mean, obviously, it appears as though um, EDF is not proposing any changes to those programs as well. Is that correct? Not to my knowledge. And that's all I have, Madam Hearing Officer. Again, as I indicated, you know, we'll certainly be addressing the admissibility of this testimony in our post hearing submittals. All right, thank you, Mr. DeSalvo. Thank you, Madam Hearing Officer. Uh, can you hear me okay? Good. Uh, uh, good evening, Dr. Thompson. Uh, I just have a few questions for you. Um, um, first of all, uh, pollutant levels can vary quite a bit uh, within a given area. Would you agree with that? Yes. Oh, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm sorry. My name is Charles DeSale, and I um, I represent the New Mexico Environmental Law Center here. Um, so, for example, if and we've we've been talking about ozone quite a bit. So let's let's look at ozone. For example, if EPA concludes that in a given county in New Mexico, uh, the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, primary standards for ozone are, are in compliance, you could have localized areas where uh, the ozone levels are actually quite a bit higher than the ambient air quality standards. Is that correct? Yes, they're called hotspots terminology. Could you elaborate on that a little bit, please? Um, well, so because atmospheric chemistry is so nonlinear and because there are so many components that are required in the formation of ozone, um, yeah, there and um, atmospheric physics and dispersion um, create uh, highly variable um, concentrations of all the pollutants, all of them leading to the formation of ozone and some of them that may destroy ozone, creating a highly variable atmosphere. And so, yes, I would say ozone being a secondary pollutant, however, will be less variable than primary pollutants. So meaning that um, because it's formed in the atmosphere and things tend to have more time to be a little bit more well mixed, um, ozone will be less variable than primary pollutants like NO2, which is also covered under the NAx, and then hazardous air pollutants are also primary and they would be more variable. Okay, thank you. And then um, you talked, you mentioned briefly that scientists have been trying to reduce the, uh, the um, standards for ozone uh, for a while. And as, um, as I recall, the, um, the Clean Air Science Advisory Committee, if I have that right, I think it's the case act um, a number of years ago recommended that the um, uh, the NACs, the National Ambient Air Quality Standards for ozone primary again, um, actually be lowered to 65 parts per billion. Do I have that correctly? I believe um, the the window that they had set, they, I mean, as low as 60, I, I believe was initially one of their recommendations, but. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Thompson. That's all my questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. DeSalin. Are there any other parties with questions of Dr. Thompson? No, uh, let me turn to the board for their questions. Uh, while I'm doing that, if you're an attendee on this platform and have a question, please reach out through the chat. Uh, Madam Chair, do you have a question? Yes, Madam Hearing Officer, I do. I have a couple of questions for um, Ms. Thompson. Thank you again for your testimony. Appreciate it. Um, you had talked a little bit about risk level and some of the health um, studies that have been done recently. and um, and uh, having worked in compliance up at the laboratory at Los Alamos, I, I've had to look at some risk studies. And so um, I was just wondering if there was any risk studies and analysis done of like, uh, for example, you talked about acute exposure and acute risk. 
um, or acute uh, a risk associated with acute exposure, I think it was. Is there has there been any studies of, um, say, year over year or even generation to generation of exposure related? I think in, you mentioned in terms of benzene. So, um, you know, in my introduction, I mentioned that um, my expertise is to understand how to model air pollution concentrations and interpret the, um, the potential for health impacts from exposure. So this is where I will go ahead and um, say that my expertise is not in determining the relationship between, um, or how to set those limits basically. Um, or how to set what um, what the, those risk factors would be. It's about how to understand how to model the potential for those concentrations and interpret the, the modeling based on the limits that other um, epidemiologists have set. So I am I am not as familiar with that literature, but I I, I understand how to interpret it. Okay, uh, thank you for that response. And I, um, I, I was getting back to, I think, to the um, recommendation of the thousand foot. And I think uh, your colleague had mentioned that was really based upon the Colorado uh, rules. Um, from a, from a, a health um, perspective, do you have any comment on uh, the thousand foot versus, say, 500 or 2000 or? Any other incremental? I think you had mentioned uh, another um, distance of 2,000. That's right, and um, you know, five, 500 would be would be more protective of human health, right? But it's a compromise, and so um, you know that also is outside of my expertise is understanding or like, you know, understanding those compromises, but I can report on the fact that 500 would be more protective of human health and would, um, you know, reduce that, that risk that we, that I talked about with respect to benzene and even average exposure uh, of benzene at that 500 mark leading to an increased chance of of, of cancer. Okay, uh, Madam Hearing Officer, and thank you, Ms. Thompson. That's all I have for now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the Vice Chair chat, uh, put in chat that she does not have any questions. Um, I don't know if Member Bitzer is still on the platform. Uh, Member Garcia? No questions, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And Member Honker, I'm not sure if he's on the platform. No. All right. Uh, did any of that raise a uh, redirect for you, uh, Ms. Perenos? Uh, Madam Hearing Officer, no redirect for Ms. Thompson, but I did just want to note for the benefit of the board that EDF Exhibit II is the CDPHE study that Dr. Thompson was referring to in her testimony. That's the uh, Colorado study? Correct. That's the Colorado Public Health and Environment Study. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Thompson, for your testimony. Thank you for the opportunity to talk with you. I'm wondering now if we move to Mr. Blewett. Mr. Rose? Um, Madam Hearing Officer, I don't believe we are going to present uh, Mr. Blewett um, on this topic. Oh, okay. Um, I have them here, but okay. Uh, so then do we move to, let's see here. Do we move to Professor Via? Madam hearing officer? Yes. Um, I, I, if you could give us uh, just a moment. I think we are ready to go. Although my co-counsel, who's going to be putting on uh, Professor Via, I think was was putting his child to, to bed. Um, so I, I just want to, uh, uh, if you if you give me, if it's possible to have a, a 
uh, just a few minutes to see if I can uh, get him on. Certainly, let's uh, take a 10 minute uh, uh, break. Um, it, if uh, if that works, that work. All right, seven thirty. 